bad loss. That's a big ball hitter. Heavy, very heavy. This is an old bull hipper. Look at the size of those tusks. You see how these tusks are so worn down. They're really worn down. That's that would have been the lower jaw from an old bull. The remains of the hipper are just here. What they would have done probably is sat on the edge of the river waiting for it to pop its head up and then if they got enough, close enough with a shot or even out of a dugout canoe they might get relatively you know, accustomed to the fishermen being around. They would um, just, just give it a brain shot and after one hour a hippo floats. It's quite easy to kill a hippo. And once it's floated, they just hack up the meat and they'll put it on a rack like this. So all these branches would be cut and a rack would be made and they light a fire underneath. But it's, you can see the extent of this rack. It's probably eight foot wide by probably about 12 foot long. You can see that uh, the guys try to cut it down. place where we are standing, it's just uh, the southern part of the reserve where it borders uh, the southern villages which border the, the reserve. So the place, it's very close to, to, to village land. So, and in this regard, uh, we call upon the, the community living adjacent to the Ezegea reserved areas. Um, to understand that there's animals, there's uh, wildlife animals are, are theirs and we protect them um, on behalf of them. So whenever they see wildlife, they have to protect them uh, with all the energy that they have. So I call upon them that they should stop poaching their wildlife. A whole hippo, which can weigh a couple of tons or more, can be dried up and put into, say, just a couple of sacks. Two or three people could carry an entire hippo out, put it in a boat, take it across the river. There's a big town down here, not very far away, Ugala. It's probably a market for meat there. There's no knowing who actually would have done it, for sure. It would have been poachers, meat poachers. Whether or not they're actually directly connected with the fishermen in this river or not, we don't know. But they all seem to accommodate each other. One of the tough things that we have in an area this size is one I think we figured out that we could probably have at least five six units running around doing various jobs in various sections but we've sort of determined that one needs one unit that's constantly up and down the river here one needs a unit that's constantly in the lake and probably at least four other units in various other parts that maintain a presence in these areas. So even though we've got two full-time, sometimes three, sometimes four, various teams running around the area, we're, we're not able to be in every location all the time. Welcome to the Interwilderness Podcast. I'm your host, Byron Pace, and this is a Modern Huntsman production. You are listening to From the Front Lines, a series presented by Rocky Talkie, and this is episode three. If you haven't heard the first two, you are missing out. 
So skip back a few shows and hear about the intricacies and complexities of rhino conservation with Alex and Annette Olofsson and John Banovich. You just heard Derek Hurt speaking from the Robin Hurt Wildlife Foundation in Tanzania, followed by the regional commander of Tower, the government body for conservation in the country. As we investigated a hippo poaching incident inside the game reserve, I was documenting a few weeks back. The work they are doing at the Robin Hurt Wildlife Foundation is incredible, and you're about to find out about the daily pressure they face keeping nature safe inside a million and a half acres. I would encourage you to support their work by visiting robinhart.com and clicking the conservation tab. The link is also in the description, and over the coming months you will see some of the content I captured while I was there, so keep an eye out for that on my social as well as the Robin Hurt Wildlife Foundation pages. But before we get to that, this series is presented by Rocky Talkie Radios, which I've been using on productions over the last few months. You may not know that $2 from every radio sold goes to support search and rescue teams. And currently, a search and rescue awards is running from Rocky Talkie. Today, the 26th of July, they will be announcing the 2023 shortlist, where you will have a chance to vote on the story that you find the most inspiring. Head over to Rocky Talkie's socials, their website, or the American Alpine Club website to take part. Lastly, but by no means least, a thank you to this week's Patreon supporters. You help make these shows possible. In the top tier this week, Richard McNeil, Ronnie Speakman of RD Contracting, James Marchington, the guys at South Ash Stalking, Dick X. Romer, Mark Zabrowski, and Leslie Cumming. If you would like to support the show, head over to patreon.com forward slash Byron Pace. Derek, welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. I've had the most incredible seven or eight days or whatever it's been with you. We're currently sitting with your Land Cruiser as a windbreak on the edge of the airstrip about to fly out. Uh, Well, first of all, thank you for having me. You're most welcome. It's been so good having you. And actually, it's been really good to have an opportunity to be here for a week without, not the pressures of hunting, but without the commitment of hunting with guests. Yeah. And so it's given me the opportunity to get around the area, first of all, show you around, introduce you to everything we're doing here, uh, which really hinges around our anti-poaching community work and development, but also just our area management, you know, the, the scale of it. The... This, this place is huge. It's also incredible. The biodiversity here is phenomenal. Um, <laughs> we might have to turn your radio off. Uh, let me see. Um, yeah. What are you connected to? Yeah, just pick that up. It's, I think it's round your chair. You know the amount of times that happens? <laughs> that happened when I recorded with Alex a few weeks back, exactly the same thing. <laughs> Halfway through, like, I think I'm gonna have to turn the radio off. So yeah, I think, you, I think they'll have to live without you for an hour. He's always so busy with people. Anyway, um, <clears throat> the biodiversity here is, is incredible. What an amazing area. I was saying to you the other day that there's parts of this that remind me of the Delta in Botswana, which I think a lot of people will be familiar with as a, as a sort of global destination that people go. Describe this place to me. We're in Tanzania. There'll be plenty of people in the world who don't even know where Tanzania is in the continent of Africa, but give some global context to where we're at. Right, so Tanzania is located on East African coast, just south of the equator. Uh, it borders, or it's, it's on the southern border of Kenya, and it's on the northern border of Mozambique, and to the west we have the Congo, which is separated by Lake Tanganyika. We also have several other countries around us, such as Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and Malawi. But we have probably a couple of thousand kilometers of coastline. Tanzania is, has its own ports. And where we are situated here is about, wow, I wouldn't, you know, 1,500 kilometers or something inland as the crow would fly from the coastline to the, towards the western side of the country. The um, So where we are located is actually on the Ugala River system. It's a massive wetland system around us where the Ugala River flows from the east around towards the west and then heads up north. So the actual corner of the Ugala River takes place where we are. 
So we have a southern border of the Ogala River, a western border of the Ogala River, which then spills out into a lake called Lake Sagara, which is about 70 kilometers long. It's a fresh water system. So Lake Sagara basically cuts across our northern part of the area, where the river then also overflows and carries on away to the west towards Lake Tanganyika. Mm -hmm. which is, Some people might have heard of that. Yeah, Lake Tanganyika yeah. is uh, a massive lake. It's, it's very deep. It's the second deepest lake in the world. It's the largest volume of fresh water in the world. So yeah, it's an amazing place. Tanzania has all sorts of amazing places. Mm. It yeah. is an incredible country. And, and one of them is this amazing place where we are right here. And this is, if I'm remembering correctly, a million and a half acres. That's about the size of the section of the area that we operate. There are some parts of the area which are relatively inaccessible, such as across a portion of the Ugala River to the northwest, and also north of the Lake Sagara, which really, that's more of an area where there's more settlement. We have less need to go there. So we tend to keep to our section. So yeah, it's about one and a half million acres that we manage and operate in. And this is a hunting concession. Just explain how that model of management and funding for conservation works in Tanzania generally. Yeah, Tanzania really, <clears throat> one has to take your hat off to the government here. They really do have really good policy. They have set aside something in the region of about 35% of their land mass towards conservation. And That's wilderness. really high. It's very high. It's, 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 they really need to be congratulated on this for maintaining this system. And in fact, actually recently, they've even increased more national parks and more game reserves, all being fully protected wilderness areas. But uh, so out of that, I would be inclined to say about 70% of that wilderness is not national park. That means it falls under areas commonly known locally as wildlife management areas or open areas where there are communities living or even game reserves. So a game reserve here is really just a protected wilderness, but it has no revenue stream and typically these are areas that are not popular for general tourism for multiple reasons. One, accessibility. Uh, we are- It's pretty one, inaccessible here. I can definitely attest to we that. We are one and a half days drive away from Arusha, which is the main tourist center of Tanzania. Or if we came from Dar es Salaam on the coast, <laughs> also about one and a half days drive away. Mm. And we it's are, a long day driving, I'll just add as well. It's, this isn't just a, a sort of casual six hours. Nah, it's <laughs> 10 hour days. Yeah. yeah. And, um, or alternatively, a very expensive air charter. So there's not much going on here that appeals to general tourism. Also, the environment inside that beautiful wetland system that surrounds us, which encompasses of the river, the swamps, the lake, the papyrus fields, the floating vegetation, that's all one ecosystem. There's a second ecosystem inside this area which is what is properly known as Brachystigia woodland. Locally, we call it Miombo woodland, where it's large, tall, sort of 15, 20 meter high can open canopy. It's a relatively open forest. Wildlife densities are pretty thin on the surface. There's a lot of wildlife here. There's a lot of species here. You can go all day and not see anything, as you've seen whilst you've been here. That's also partly due to the time of year. We're very early in the season, which I can come to in a minute. But um, yeah, it's it's a it's not really an appealing place for mass tourism. So what the government have done is they've allowed hunting to be a conservation model that operates in these areas, and in fact we call it tourist hunting here in Tanzania which allows for sportsmen to come on a safari to a place like this, where it really is truly wild. 
Yeah. You know, you really you are away from you're away from everything. There's you no are. mod corns around here. No. I've There's, been to a lot of places in Africa, but this is this is right up there with the wildest for sure. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, you can't just pop into the local supermarket or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. That that in itself is a whole day away. Um, so, yeah, it's so it's a very appealing to hunters, and there are lots of very interesting species here, which also are, are harvested on a sustainable basis, with a annual quota that is given to the operators, and that in turn generates a lot of revenue, which goes back to the government and helps in turn sustain this as a wildlife reserve. Mm -hmm. If it were not for that revenue, I could assure you there wouldn't be anything here. It would just be farmland, cattle, and what it would potentially be thousands and thousands of animals and one and a half million acres of open forest wouldn't be here. And <clears throat> that that argument that you've just made, which justifies this model, is used a lot by the hunting community. And I've seen this now myself firsthand this week, and it's been quite quite staggering, actually. Um, you said to me the other day, and and, and Joash, uh, when I was interviewing him this morning, I asked the question, "How long do you think this?" incredible wilderness area would last if there was no boots on the ground here doing anti-poaching and, and you operating as a safari operator here with all the investment that you have. And he said, I'm going to be generous, I would say, a year and a half. I think you said to me two years. I could assure you, without even thinking about it, in two years it would all be gone. Mm. So having hunting as a conservation tool here keeps it. It's... It, for some people, I think particularly those who are, maybe have never been to Africa at all, but that notion is probably quite a difficult one to grasp. That you could, a million and a half acres. Most people don't, can't even, I mean, I even struggle, even though I've been driving around it now for a week, to really grasp how large that area is. This is massive. How on earth can a million and a half acres in terms of its, its wilderness and ecosystem be degraded and essentially gone? in a year or marginally more. What, what, explain that cascade of events to me that we actually saw, you showed me, on the border of this area just over the last couple of days. Yeah, um, I mean, we have a population desperate for places to go to. And I don't blame them. The minute there's an available patch of new territory to move into, it's a bit like moving into the West in the USA back in the day. It's no different, you know, there's new territory to go and settle and farm and plow up and remove the forest and do whatever one does. And in the process, at the destruction of much wildlife as, as United States- But can, they learned that lesson. They learned their lesson yeah. with the loss of 30 million bison. And they're still trying to put it back together now. Yeah, so that's what, several hundred years later. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's, we have a lot of people looking for the same thing, a place to live, a place to farm. Maybe 95% of this country lives off subsistence. You know, so the people can only, they live off what they can grow on their farms. So maybe maize is a staple crop, maybe something like cotton that we've seen over the last couple of days as a cash crop rice is grown in some of the wetter patches mm. where they've converted big uh, there's an open field which is a wetland mud system here which we call mbugas and these mbugas have been converted into paddy fields in many places as, we, as we've seen uh, you know i'm talking now outside of the reserve and this is all rice. Rice production in Tanzania is, is a massive industry. I didn't realize that but mm. it, it's Incredible the yeah. amount of rice fields I've seen and, and it's really nice rice. It's good rice. Yeah, I wouldn't I would never buy imported rice if <laughs> compared to this. It's great stuff um, Yeah, so what else are people are growing? We've seen a, a bit of cassava. We've seen lots of sweet potatoes So those are the typical typical crops that people are growing both to sell and to live off themselves and then of course there's cattle and 
goats and the odd sheep around as well, which the people don't trade in their cattle here. They're more of a status symbol. But the that, that's quite and, amazing to because yeah. I was just confirming because I, I knew about this from my time in Kenya, and I wasn't sure if it was the same culturally here because we're 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 for, much further south than your northern border with mm. Kenya, but. There's a lot of cattle here, and it is in itself a, an issue for the ecosystem. Just to explain that. Well, first of all, it's the impact it has, mm. but also the fact that this isn't for food, which blows my yeah. mind. Well, I, I think let's look at the pastoralist peoples of the African continent. Many of them traditionally come from cultures where your wealth it's not a monetary wealth as we see it in our society. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a wealth in terms of their status. The more cattle you have, the wealthier you are, the more, the, the more your status is in society. So you're more highly regarded. And so typically they don't really want to be trading or selling in those cattle because that's like getting rid of your cash. Uh, so as I was about to say shortly ago, you know, sheep and goats would be harvested more for meat than or sold for other goods you know they may they may sell a goat in the market and might be able to buy some flashlights or kettles or cooking pots or whatever to take home the um, impact of cattle of course is coming uh, verging into wilderness areas is something that we really have to watch very closely and, and to try and keep them outside of the game reserve area and this is something that we as our company do a lot, we, we, we generally call it anti-poaching because it's just part of area management and area protection. It's policing an area. It's, it's, it, this, is a, this is a project that we actually do in partnership with the government. So we have government game officers in, in each of our trucks which are patrolling the area, and they are the ones that actually have the power of arrest should we find a poacher in the field or illegal cattle in the field or somebody doing what they shouldn't be doing, cutting down trees or putting in illegal beehives or whatever it may be. There could be all sorts of different things taking place. So, but the cattle coming back to them potentially has a massive impact in multiple different ways. One, the grazing pressure on particularly riparian fields such as on the on the floodplains of the river or Lake Sagara gets overgra could get overgrazed very, very rapidly. We actually saw this yesterday. It was very obvious how heavily grazed that area had been beside the water. Yeah, that section on the Ugala River that we drove on yesterday afternoon outside of the reserve is very, very heavily grazed. The grass it looks like a mown field. It really does. And it looks like a mown lawn, in fact. Uh, so there's not much available vegetation. So that's one, competition. Secondly, these are wild animals. They're not familiar with people running around on bicycles and in some case motorcycles and let alone uh, just cattle being in an area. Wild animals like, like a peaceful environment. They need a peaceful environment where they can do their daily migration to water and back into the forests to go and lay up and morning and evening or nighttime, be it wherever they like, to be able to do their grazing. And likewise with the predators that follow them. So what we've got coming back to the cattle now is one, disturbance. Two, potential carrying of diseases. None of the cattle in these community areas are, have ever been vaccinated or wormed, so they could carry diseases that could affect other ungulates, such as buffalo, for instance. And the third thing, actually, sadly, is an indirect consequence, which has a major, major impact, is that animals such as lion find cattle to be an easy target. And the result is, is the people are upset because their, li their livestock's been killed by lion. And so they will inject insecticides into the meat and basically poison it. And a whole pride of lion could be wiped out in one sitting. And along with it, a bunch of hyena and along with it, a bunch of vultures. 
And it's just to mention vulture, vultures, by the way, yeah. they're, they're an incredible bird. They run a really important role in the environment for cleaning up. We saw one flying past yesterday afternoon, a small hooded vulture. That's the only vulture I've seen in the whole week here, which is alarming. It is actually. And that's why, and the reason why we're not seeing them is because of poisoning. So there are three major impacts from the cattle. And so it's very important for us as a combined operation to keep cattle outside of the wildlife section, the game reserve. And we actually, the first day that I arrived here, some cattle were caught. Yes, some cattle were caught close to our northeast border, but they were distinctly and clearly within the game reserve. And they were penned up and held and eventually the owner admitted that they were his cattle and they followed the procedure, which is basically he would be fined for each animal and fairly significantly. So it's quite an impact. It's not a little a bit of free grazing wasn't so free at the end of the day. And one would hope that after a while, it's less and less and less appealing for people to push their cattle into the reserve area. That pressure that you're seeing around the boundaries here, I think the most like visually impactful aspect of that that I've seen in the last couple of days was the deforestation. You, you talked about the crops that people are, are, are growing that end up replacing the bush that's there. But I think it's worth just explaining how that change comes about. Because to stand there, so we actually, we, we, were, we, were, we were in an area, this was a couple of days ago, which was in the process of being sort of converted to farmland, if you like, where there was the carcasses of trees just strewn over there. It almost looked like an atomic bomb had gone off. Um, that, is something that I don't think people will quite appreciate, is the starkness of that change and shift. Yeah, it's, imagine a forested area where you like going for a walk on a weekend or hiking. And then imagine coming to it, perhaps in two months time, and finding every single one of those trees flattened with just stumps sticking out of the ground and piles of brush put into heaps which are burnt. And all this is doing is clearing land to, to make space for planting crops. It's clearing forest. It's, uh, we, we refer to it slash and burn agriculture, slash and burn encroachment. It's, it's very, very noticeable as we've seen on the perimeter outside of the reserve here. And yeah, it's quite shocking. It's really shocking how rapidly that transformation can take place. Because we're looking, you, you were pointing out to me when we were driving areas that just last year where you'd been driving through had been what I would regard as like this pristine bush that, that we're sitting in right now behind us. Uh, we're talking about a, a wave that's thousands of meters in a year. Like, oh yeah. Thousands, well, well, probably not thousands, well, yeah, thousands of meters is one way, or probably I'm, th I'm thinking thousands, in terms of a line, like th marching. Yeah, I think you could say thousands of acres in a year. It's yeah. like a mushroom. Yeah. Uh, funnily enough, when you get encroachment or new settlement coming into a wilderness area, I tend to l refer to it like a cancer of the wilderness where that cancer starts, it's one little cell, and then it just multiplies and multiplies and it mushrooms. And eventually it just kills the entire nature environment around it. Mm. Well, I want to talk to you about investment in the communities and potential future solutions. But before we, we get to that, the, an, an extension of our discussion around poaching I've been fortunate to see many of these elements 
from what we've just discussed with the sort of the encroachment on the farming. And I was on a, an operation a couple of days ago, actually on the lake itself. Tell me about the, the illegal fishing that was or is taking place when we arrested, I think, 15 people that day. 15 people yeah. were apprehended for fishing inside the reserve boundaries and without a permit. Mm. Why, why is that such a big deal? Like, why is it a problem? You see this big lake, you can see people fishing in, in their dugouts, which might not seem like there's much harm going on there. Just to explain that um, interconnected web with the, the bigger issue that you have for protecting wildlife in the area. Well, looking back to the origins of how the river system, the Ogala River system, and the lake environment are, it's, it's like I've mentioned earlier, it's a combination of open water, swamp land, floating vegetation. There are multiple habitats, and, and it in itself is a really interesting and unique habitat, which has been managed by wildlife for thousands of years. And what happens is you've got people coming in who don't have permission to be fishing. And one of the things they're doing is they're using illegal nets in many cases. Uh, and by, by illegal, this is, this is regulation set by the yeah. government. So, so, yeah, government have set regulations for the type of net that people are allowed to fish with. It's a, the legal net is three inch and it has to be made out of sort of a small fine cord, not plastic mesh, like we've, very fine plastic mesh like we have seen. And many of these uh, fishermen also buy these cheap, fine plastic meshes that are also one inch in size. So I think in, every net that we confiscated was less, one inch or less. Yeah, they were. And they had really tiny, immature fish trapped in them. Yeah, these fish were some of the, like, the length of your thumb. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's a species that'll never breed. But the ecosystem effect is affected because these fish obviously manage vegetation in the river to a certain extent. They're, they're also fed on by animals such as otters and crocodiles. I wish I'd seen some otters this week. I've never seen one. If we sat in one place by a swamp long enough, sooner or later, you'd get a chance. And so you've got those animals. And then you've also got hippo, which also occur in these areas. And the hippo has a role of munching and breaking up big patches of grass and floating vegetation. And it keeps those waterways relatively open and active. Mm -hmm. So what we've seen indirectly happen in many places, particularly along the Ugala River, is the impacts of fishing, which I can describe. One is they're removing vast quantities of fish, affecting feed for other animals that depend on them, bird life, so on. You've then got animals that are also being impacted. So quite a few poachers, meat, commercial meat poachers, will often camp in fishing camps or fishing villages. And they are, will very often target animals like hippo. So one hippo would pr probably provide about a ton of meat, which is a lot of meat that can be sold off on the, on the local market. And here's a little contradiction in itself, is that people would rather buy that hippo meat cheaply than they would harvest a cow. <laughs> It's uh, a bit ironic. And then, of course, another impact that we've seen in the river, and I've witnessed this several times now, is crocodiles found dead. And what I think happens a lot is, you know, a beautiful animal like a crocodile, a big 15 foot would probably be about 80 years old. You know, we're talking about something that's been around for a long time, and it gets tangled up in a net and either drowns in that net or will get pulled in by the fishermen when they're pulling their nets in and then they club it on the head with an ax and that's the end of it. Mm. So we found a lot of discarded nets the other day. We found a lot of discarded nets and we found also leaving the river and lake systems going into the bushland, 
strips of nets as well, which have obviously been snagged around hooves of animals and dragged into the bush. So the fishermen actually are causing quite an impact, and not to mention also snaring along the edge of the river banks for animals like reedbuck and impala and bushbuck. So they'll set these spring traps for the bent, bent stick. So fishermen really, one would imagine in your eye, they're just a fisherman. But when you look at the greater picture of what hundreds of fishermen can, or the impact of what hundreds of fishermen can do on an ecosystem, it's massive. So yes, I'm afraid we have to really manage the fishermen. We have to always check on them. Uh, if they have a permit and everything they're doing legally is done correctly, then we leave them alone, say thank you very much and have a good day. But unfortunately, for many of the community, they don't seem to really pay attention to this and they end up getting themselves apprehended. You were, we were discussing, I think it was after, after that operation, or actually it could have actually been while we were on the water, uh, a, a potential future ambition of yours to yeah. solve some of this problem because oh, yeah. so much of the, so much of these these issues that we've been discussing so far is you know some of it is people need to eat something yeah so. and and the fish is one aspect of yes yeah. there's a commercial aspect of it as well but there's there was a really interesting idea that you had which right. i know is something you'd, you'd like to pursue in some form yeah, exactly and going on from what I just said just now, these are all poor people trying to eke out a living and a way of life one way or another and fish are for free, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we manage the fishermen and where they go and how they do things, it would actually be better off in our interest to give them a section of the lake or give them a section in a river where we could actually help them introduce the concept of fish farming. And so we could put floating cages into the river system where they could be rearing tilapia or catfish or, yeah, those are the two prime species occurring here. And not only would the fishermen be so much better off because then they could actually manage the fish and select the fish they're taking out yeah. to harvest. And they wouldn't have to spend all day and all night going out into no, the lake. No, they wouldn't. And it could be a family business that the wives and the children on the weekends and dad and uncle and grandpa and everyone else could all get involved and help look after their patch that could be 10 meters by 10 meters, whatever it may be. And they would all live a healthy life out of it. In fact, they would do very, very well out of it because the national demand for fish is enormous. Huge. So I think it goes hand in hand. But they don't have the ability or the education to start this by themselves. It happens in other parts of the country where projects have been started by various people. It happens in many other countries as well. And I think it's something that I would really love to try and help introduce to the local people here. Yeah. But it all takes money. We have to educate. We have to set up systems. We have to, we can catch the local stock from the lake right there. It's easy, easy to catch the stock. Um, we could have fish, fish cages for catfish. We could have fish cages for tilapia. And it'd be wonderful to see these people. In fact, it would benefit us. We, we could go to a fish farm and know that we could get nice fresh tilapia camp, yeah. to have in camp. It'd be, yeah. it'd be lovely. And this is the kind of project that, um, given your ability to be able to source funding for it, that your foundation w would love to implement, if oh, possible. We're working absolutely. with the government, of course. Absolutely. I would, I would love to, you know, I really would like to be able to try and find ways of generating funds to help initiate these programs. And we can start small and let's hope it can grow bigger. Uh, but it's, yeah, but I was just thinking, you know, rather than people that live in fear of being chased down or caught by the government officers who are checking on what they're doing, along with our teams, because we're facilitating with boats and so on as well at the moment. It'd be, so it'd be nice to be able to go into a community where you're seeing happy, smiley faces, they're all saying hello with, you know, and happy to see you. Mm -hmm. rather than somebody who's nervous and trying to paddle away as far as fast as you can. And actually, talking about paddling away, 
One of their favorite vessels in the water is a Barassus palm tree, which has probably taken a hundred years to grow. And that's been hacked down and hollowed out and turned into a dugout canoe. These things only last a year or so, and then they're rotten, so they go and cut down the next palm tree. So that would be another benefit from fish farming. The lack of, you wouldn't they have the same need. They wouldn't yeah. have the pressure in the wilderness of hacking down all these beautiful palm trees. And they really are beautiful and they're stunning. We may hear a little rustle in the background. No, I think we're, we're, it's very windy today, so I think we'll definitely be hearing some rustling. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but um, I know from our trip yesterday that in terms of using funds from your operation here and putting back into the community, you, you between your, yourself and your, your dad, I mean, I'd like to, as we carry on this conversation, talk about your dad a bit because he's, uh, I think most people would definitely regard him as a living legend, um, have been putting money into community projects for 30 years in this area. And Tell me about and, some of well, those. Well, that's just in this area. Yeah. But, but in this country since the mid 80s, really, when dad started operating here. But uh, one of dad's initial concepts was particularly up in the north when he started operating was the the impact of massive poaching that took place in the country and that was really targeting the fringes of the wildebeest migration mm. on the edge of Serengeti. Was that also during the big ivory poaching era? No, or that, that, come was after? Another, that was another period. Okay. Yeah. But um, what? so basically back then he realized two things needed to happen. One, the wilderness needed to be protected and the wildlife with it. Two, the people had to become a beneficiary somehow and realize the advantage of having a wilderness and, and also, sorry, having a wilderness and the wildlife around them and how they can benefit from it. And usually the benefits indirect, but by doing this, <clears throat> he created a lot of community incentives like classrooms at schools or in the case of one of the villages we drove through yesterday there was a whole school that I pointed out that was built by our company as proceeds that we were able to generate with support from guests and people donating and from us digging into our own pockets as well and that has gone a long way and this, here's a school 30 years later, that's it's still growing. Yeah, I, think, I, I asked I think the teacher yesterday, 950 people. 900, yeah, I guessed about 600 and I was, I was, <laughs> I was way off. So there you go, 960 pupils in a, in a school. That's a big job. But uh, these kids are all beneficiaries indirectly from the wildlife in the wilderness here because that school wouldn't have been as it is otherwise. So that's a great start. Uh, there are clinics that have been built and government offices and wells for cleaner water. And over the years, we've done many, many community projects, not only in this area, but over quite a few areas in Tanzania where we have operated over the last 30 years or so. Hmm. It's, and if that is a direct link between the survival um, of the wildlife and the ecosystems in the area and community benefit. If there weren't operators like yourselves in an area like that with the revenue that that generates, would, would any of that happen or would it just take a lot longer? I mean, certainly when I was going, when I was walking around yesterday, the buildings that you pointed out, and, and some of them were built you know, over the, the period of the last couple of decades, were in the best condition of any of the buildings in, that we were walking around. Yeah, well, that was nice to see, actually. I was yeah. very happy to see their pride in looking after it. It, it seemed great. like that, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah it's... Yeah, you know, the communities have to be beneficiaries. But I was just going to say, you know, it's we, we have to work it two ways. We've got a lot, as where I can, or where we can as a company, we employ as many local people in our camps as possible. So I would say in our camp here, other than a real specialized job, such as the vehicle drivers or the cooks or the um, 
skinners or people like that who are more specialised. Many of the other jobs that take place are local people who've been employed. And that also has its little benefit going back. Sometimes if you drive through some of these villages, the nicer village, the nicer houses in the village are those of people who work with us. Hmm. I mean, for instance, like Gordy, who's one of our trackers. He's been with me all week. He's been with you all week. Uh, he, I mean, he's got a lovely little house in the village. We should have actually gone to see it when he drove through. But anyway, uh, regardless. Uh, so they, they have a better standard of life. And that's a direct result of employment and working with us on safari. There can't be much other employment here. There is a little bit. There are, there are other industries. I mean, I'll come back to some of that in, mm. in a moment. There are some other industries here that do create a lot of work for people. But uh, going back to our direct relationship here, uh, a vast number of our anti-poaching teams are made up of local people who are trained village game scouts, which are abbreviated to VGS. And they work as part of our team, alongside with our trackers, in fact, who are also local people in many cases. Half of our trackers here are local people. And they have worked with us here mostly for 20 years. One of them here has been with us since he was 16. He's my age, you know, he's, <laughs> he's worked for the company for 35 years. It's in fact, two of the people with us, you know, so they, they've all come from local hunting areas around here. And yeah, so so you've got you, you've got you've got all these people. It's not so it's it's camping staff. It's it's trackers. It's it's village game scouts. And when we come back to this area, particularly referring to this one, and re, we we have to reopen it every single year after the rainy period when it starts drying out, where we have more than one thousand kilometers of roads that re, need reopening each year. It's a massive commitment. It's uh, a lot of those people who are working on those projects with us are also local people who we hire. And it's, so it's just additional labor. There's a, there's a lot of people that really love us being here, mm. which, is, which is wonderful. Uh, coming back now, you ask about other employment, the beekeeping industry and the honey industry here in West Tanzania is huge. That's a big thing. That does employ quite a few people and it's a good revenue earner. And... I'm happy that that's there for the people. It's, it's, uh, we find it a little bit of an impact coming into us in the wildlife section of the area in that the beekeeping people that come into the area setting up their hives or harvesting, it's usually it's about twice a year that they come in for several weeks at a time creates quite an impact, one being disturbance, because it's like ants just being let loose into the wilderness, mm. and there are people in every corner of the area. Because these and are you, wild bees rather than what, in a lot of the world, I think when, when you say beekeepers, I think a lot of people are picturing mm. the square boxes that go on the ground and you put your own hives in. Yeah. But that's, that's not how it operates here. So, yeah, so in fact, they are not the square box, as you say, and they're not a box with bee separators in or, or fancy modern bee systems. But the law now requires beekeepers to put a wooden box in the field. But most of the way they do it is high up in a tree. I suppose that's putting the bees closer to the, closer to the flowers, if you like, I guess. And it also keeps the beehives in a harder place to reach from little animals like honey badgers. Yeah, which are, I was going to say. Yeah, a honey badger would be considered a terrorist to a beekeeper. I mean, <laughs> they are amazing creatures in their own right. But yes, yeah. they are vicious. Yeah. So yeah, so that's how they do it. The tr more traditional ways, which are being phased out and are now currently illegal, are ring barking a tree and stripping the bark off and making a barrel, so to speak, out of the bark, which is a fascinating art in itself, but it's not allowed to be done anymore. Because it kills so many trees. Because it kills so many trees. It kills tens of thousands of trees, in fact. And likewise for hollowing out a log or cutting down a palm tree and hollowing that out. And we so actually saw this the other day. We've seen this. We've seen this in several places. No, yeah. I mean the big pile that we, oh, we saw. Oh, we saw a pile. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yep. Yeah. 
um, not supposed to happen. We don't know who they belong to, but I think everybody has a pretty good idea who they belong to. And I'm sure somebody will hear more about it in the near future. The, so this month now, so we're actually late June into early July is one of the main periods when they're putting their hives back up in the trees. So this right now is a disturbance period. But sadly also many beekeepers are kind of hunter-gatherers in, in a way. It's the mindset is that of a hunter-gatherer. Some of them have turned it more commercial. But unfortunately quite a few of our poaching related incidents across this area and in other areas that we've worked in are directly related to beekeepers. So they're not just out getting honey from a hive. They're often setting snares or hunting down animals with homemade muzzle loaders or they're, they're, they're poaching. They're poaching for meat. Mm. We actually saw, I mean, I guess there's no way to actually prove it, but we actually saw what is more than likely an instance of that the first day that I arrived. That's right. Well, in that particular case, fortunately, it was only for guinea fowl, but it all starts somewhere. You start snaring for guinea fowl and you get away for it. The next day you try and snare for a bush buck or something bigger, and then you might set a bigger snare for something as big as a buffalo. Or, sadly to say, giraffe. And there is a place where there's no sign of it now, but several years back we found a snare line where there are multiple snares set through a woodland on an approach to a watering point where trees get folded over to create barriers and then gaps are left between those uh, f between that fence so to speak mm -hmm. and in those fence in those gaps are set snares so some of them are set low for animals walking through and some of them are set high maybe 10 feet underneath a branch where something like a giraffe is forced to bend down and it gets its neck caught in there. And there's one place not far from where our camp is actually, and very close to where our camp used to be, where we found a recently killed giraffe and a giraffe that had obviously been killed by a snare the year before and several sable. And in fact, the thing that brought us into that particular spot was, was a group of vultures, which was lovely to see. And so we went to investigate thinking there was a lion kill, having seen lion tracks earlier that day. And there was a lion feeding on a snare, I mean, on a snared sable, a young sable bull. Um, so that gave us, well, as soon as we hopped out the car, the lion decided that we weren't very good business and decided to move off. And we removed all the snares. I think we took down about a dozen snares on that one particular day. And we, these are these are seriously strong winch cables. So, yeah, it's actually interesting to also think that that lion could have also very easily been caught in a snare. Mm. And it takes me back to when my father started operating. And they were when they started operating in mass were back in the 80s, back in the mid 80s, moving forward. I think he said for the first two years they were there, they didn't see any lion. And in fact, maybe one of them, maybe they did catch see one lion, but it had three legs. One of the legs had obviously been lost to a snare. And the leopard population was way down as well. So many animals that were not intended to be snared got caught. And so that's really where a whole load of these programs actually began. Get the anti-poaching guys out on the ground. We look for snares. We look for poachers with muzzle loaders. We look for any form or means where they're harvesting the wildlife illegally. And policing, looking after the wilderness. At the same time, trying to raise incentives to benefit the communities in order for them to realize that actually there's a value here. And, you know, it's, <clears throat> we really would love it that not just my grandchildren and great-grandchildren, but also their great-grandchildren and so on and going forward for generations, will be able to come out here one day and see herds of buffalo and herds of topi or eland 
or elephant or giraffe and so many other beautiful creatures that roam around here. It would be lovely for them to be able to experience it and enjoy that as well going forward. Because it, it, it definitely appears to me from you know what I've seen and the land use changes around the periphery of the pre protected areas and how quickly and rapidly that has happened, that there is a very real reality that without a lot of consistent work on the ground from anti-poaching units and maintaining these protected areas, that there genuinely will be nothing left. Yeah, I mean, obviously human populations grow and they expand and people need somewhere to live. And that's, that's important. People need to be able to go somewhere where they can comfortably get about their life. But just reflecting on how many of these places were when I first came here about 30 years ago, in certainly, and I'm referring to this particular concession where we're, where we're seated right now. They were, we drove through wilderness on a small trail the whole way. When we, when we left the main road, which back in those days was a dirt gravel road, when we left the main road to get in down to camp, if it was dry enough, we would generally be able to get to camp in a day. Uh, so nowadays we have a gravel road coming to the nearest village, which is about 30 kilometers away. So our access has improved, but at the same time, with all of this, there's a massive, massive community. So most of that land which, where we used to drive through woodland is now farmland. Now, you know, but that was, it never was, it never was a protected area. It was never a game reserve. It was it never, it just happened to just be bush because there was less of a population back then. So the impact really is that any wildlife that was in those areas has also gone with the woodland. Now, in some cases, it would have moved into other areas, but it doesn't mean, I can't tell you that we're seeing greater concentrations of animals mm, okay. in this area than we ever did before. Animals seem to find their own natural balance of what's a sustainable number. So it's not like they were pushed into the area as, as the human population around the area grew. I think one can say really realistic that there's a lot of illegal harvesting that also takes place. And one can do your very best to try and police and go looking for snares and things like that, but we don't find it all. The more units we have, the more we'll find. The more units we have, the more we can protect. The more units we have here, the better it'll be for the future. And the better it'll be for the local communities as well. And for the wildlife and everything. So. Yeah, it it's just really boils down to sustainability of being able to keep going and working in conjunction with the government, with the Tanzania Wildlife Authority and the other authorities in these er who help manage these areas with us to look after these places for the future. But it takes a huge amount of resources to do so. Economically, how do you make it work? Because what... The manpower that I've seen here, and, I, and, and we've discussed what you would love to have in terms of resources for people on the ground to maintain and improve the conservation work that you're doing. How do you, how do you make that work? And where does the support come from? We reach out for help. There's absolutely no way we can afford to do this by ourselves. Our love and passion for looking after these areas is is deep. Our future, how our whole livelihoods depend on the well-being of these areas. And even though we're hunting, we love these animals. Our animals are our future. They're like our livestock on the farm. A, uh, you know, a, a sheep farmer is not going to eradicate all his, his, his entire flock of sheep overnight because he wouldn't have anything for the future. He would harvest the odd one on a sustainable basis. And that's the same way as we do our hunting. But that enables us to do the day-to-day -day management of our company and keep ourselves going with our equipment and vehicles. But to actually re go out further and operate anti-poaching programs and 
community health and wellness programs and various things like that. We're reaching out to people all the time. We're asking, we're asking for support. And really, we're still running on a shoestring. It, we, we could do so, so much more here. And we, I have to say, I'm ever, ever so grateful to various people who've helped us. We have one family organization, foundation, that has very kindly helped us cover the expenses of the anti-poaching here in Luganzo over the last two years. And really, I can't thank them enough. You know, that's a massive commitment and a massive support. Without them, we so much would have been undone. Uh, shortly before that, we had the COVID period and we had no safaris coming in. We had no spare revenue at all. And so I decided to take my little kids, aged 10 and 12, up Mount Kilimanjaro and on a sponsorship basis managed to raise 50,000 US dollars. That's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. I'm proud of my little boys getting to the top of that mountain. And that goes a long way yeah. in what you're trying to achieve yeah, here. That, that gave us, that actually gave us 10 months worth of boots on the ground. That's amazing. Of anti-poaching, yeah. So, you know, it's really, roughly speaking, we're looking at $5,000 per anti-poaching unit. Per month. Per month. Okay. And ideally in an area like this, I think we calculated that one would really need about seven units, including river and lake units, operating on a full-time basis. And we're currently operating two of our units full-time in conjunction with government officers who are allocated to work with our teams. And we also contribute a lot to supporting one and sometimes two of the local tower or Tanzania Wildlife Authority units as well. So if they, so we help accommodate them out here to help look af look after stuff. So it's yeah, it's it's really a big reaching out and asking for support for like-minded people, like-minded foundations, people who love wildlife, who love wilderness. But but let's not forget the communities. The people need to live here too. So anybody who's keen to support communities. We need more education and a lot more of it. We need more schools. We need better health. We need to create local industries and businesses such as the fish farming that we spoke about earlier. We need to find ways where we can probably encourage the honey people to be producing the honey outside of the game reserve rather than inside it because we really could do without that disturbance that takes place here. Uh, I'm sure there are several other little industries that could take place. Uh, <clears throat> and I, so yeah, that's we would like to be able to do all of this, but really it means reaching out and asking for support. You gave me quite a, an amazing number the other day about the, the, the amount of investment in conservation and communities that has happened yeah. here. Yeah, so when I took over, so to speak, of the day-to-day -day involvement with the management of our company. An area that I've always personally had a real connection to, thanks to Dad bringing me up this way and introducing me to it, is the conservation side of our, is of our business. And so I decided that I wanted to keep a running record so we have an annual updated record of what, what everything that we spent on conservation in the area. So that means the improvements that we do in the area to make it easier to manage, easier to look after, the anti -poach, physical anti-poaching expenses, the contributions to various schools and other community programs. So we now, over, since 2006, since I started keeping that document, have now spent three and a half million dollars on conservation here. It's a phenomenal amount of money. It is. It's a great volume, you know. And I again, I just say thank you so much to so many people out there who have helped us achieve this. It really has gone a long way. Um, I.
yeah, I just can't thank anybody enough. It's it's you know it sort of brings tears to my eyes thinking at what how what wonderful people they've been to help support like this. Yeah. And it it requires very generous people to help. The reality is you you need support like that, and I've seen it in other places as well. Mm. Um, to be able to achieve what you've achieved so far and keep it going, it would be very sad to see things go backwards. That's that's the thing, really. Is sometimes you get support in a once-off donation for something, which is you know I'm I'm not saying no. I, I appreciate it so much. Every little bit helps. But when you run out of funds, the guys hang up their cloaks and go home. There's no work. We can't employ people if we don't have money to employ them. Mm. And I'm referring to the conservation work here yeah. and the community work. You've been hunting a long time. Yeah. I'm assuming that it, it was that path, well, well, I'm sure you were free to make any decisions you wanted. Um, that path feels like it was kind of set for you, given who your dad is. Yeah, I mean, dads, you couldn't have more of an icon than a father <laughs> like ours. Roger and I are so fortunate to have a, a dad to li have brought us up into this world. I, I would love to be able to sit down and podcast with him someday, maybe next time I visit Namibia. Absolutely, you should go and talk to him. Yeah. I'm sure he would love to. And he, he is so active in his conservation motivation to this day i mean they're running their own project just for rhino in tanzania which is being very successful and something that himself and his wife pauline created so uh yeah but i suppose going back to the hunting yeah we've grown up with it i mean ever since i can remember dad was going off to the bush and as i got older i was privileged enough to go out with him and my two little lads, they're starting getting to the age where they can spend a little bit more time with me as well. In fact, sadly, if my elder son hadn't <laughs> broken his arm, he'd be with us right now. Uh, so, yes, so it's very unfortunate on his part. But, yeah, so, yeah, growing up in the bush, being around hunting, seeing the wildlife, that wildlife really just becomes so much a part of what we are, who we are, um, beautiful creatures. Our life is all about them. But I don't limit our lives just to hunting. We also do a lot of photographic safaris as well. And I would really, really like to try and get a really exclusive little photographic thing going in a corner of this area. Mm -hmm. I, th I think the beauty of this area, particularly on the edge of Lake Sagara, is pristine. It's stunning. You've got the lake. It's, I, I do feel there is a little future there. And when I say that, we can compare little sections of this area to the Okavango Delta in Botswana. And the entire Okavango Delta in Botswana 40 years ago was all hunting areas. There was no photo tourism there. Nowadays, it's totally sustained by photo tourism and there's very little hunting there. So that's how things can change. I don't think this area has quite the same scale that the Okavango does, but in a very small way, we should be able to operate at least one camp on a similar kind of basis. Mm. Accessibility is the big issue, but the world is becoming a smaller place. Aircraft are more easily found to get around. <clears throat> we have national parks to the west of us, such as the Mahalin Mountains, which are very popular for chimpanzees. There's the Katavi National Park to the south, which is a great seasonal national park, quite similar to this area in many ways to the south. So why can't we be part of that circuit? I think there is a future there. How, in your decades of hunting now, how have you seen the world change? And how have you seen hunting change as restrictions have come in and how do you feel that those have impacted conservation as it's tied to hunting yeah i'm glad you asked that question actually <clears throat> it's the impacts that we've seen over the years are not in the favor of conservation 
Uh, so there seems to be a lack of understood knowledge or acceptance of hunting. Because I think there's a, for a lot of people, they see at the headline, like if I think of a home right now in the UK, yeah. trophy hunting ban, or you know this import, hunting shut down here, import, import, import trophies ban. and things like that. And I think a lot of people will see that, that well, what a win for wildlife. Mm. What a win for wildlife that somebody isn't killing it. So look at this. I and my brother and our company and many other industries in this country rely on hunters to come in to Tanzania and into other African countries to select chosen individual animals on a very sustainable basis. And we're talking about the old males that are generally surplus to breeding requirement. And so therefore we're having absolute zero impact on any wildlife population. What we're seeing, like currently, for instance, with the a, with a import of wildlife trophies or skins and skulls into the UK, the impact that has is enormous. I'll give you a very simple example. This morning I showed you a Sitatunga. It's a beautiful swamp going antelope. One. It's the first one you've ever seen. This is an animal specially adapted to living in swamps. It has specially adapted hooves. It lives in a swampy environment where a human being would struggle to even walk, let, let alone crawl. Uh, it's even difficult to find some form of machine that can even get through that kind of environment. So imagine that you said, hey, Derek, I would love to come back and hunt for a Sitatunga. That would it be was a, on my mind earlier. <laughs> it would be a premium animal. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, we're talking about coming here for a 14 day safari, preferably a 21 day safari, actually, to spend the time to really look for a nice, good old male somewhere. And just the fun, the challenge, the work, the excitement, the effort, the sweat, the itching of the grass and everything else, the mosquitoes biting you, the, the all those, <laughs> the tetsy flies, all the nasty stuff that we don't like just to go and look for that one beautiful animal. But that is where our revenue comes from as a business, uh, from, a, from the hunting side of our business. And the sad reality is, is you can't take that animal home anymore. So why would you want to come and do it? And we rely on that business, that revenue from your safari to be able to sustain these places. And it's not just us relying on it. The communities depend on it enormously. The local people in employment, the government depends on it massively through all the licensing fees and concession fees and game fees and so on. So everybody's at loss here and we're taking that away. And what's gonna happen? And you wanted to know historically what happens over the period of my life and the impacts I've seen. I've seen quite a few impacts happen. And each time something happens, it seems to have a knock-on effect of probably 20% of where we were. So hunting generally was still going pretty well until about 2007, 2008. And then we had a bit of an economic glitch in the West yeah. or globally. And massive, you, you, you understand this more than I do. I'm a bushman. But uh, obviously, a lot of money was lost. And the first thing that happens is people's holidays get cut out. That immediately had a, at least a 20, if not a 25%. In fact, initially at that very time, probably even more. Yeah. We've probably lost nearly half of our business in one year. <clears throat> So from being an area, a company where we were operating about five areas and several camps within those areas and all the conservation work in those areas, we slowly started scaling down. We wouldn't have the business to justify keeping those areas. And that we're not the only people in that sit, who are in that situation. A lot of our people in the same industry who are other hunting operating colleagues across Africa in the same boat. What happened there really was 
Well, I'll, I'll lead on to secondary impacts, another impact which is a whole different subject on its own is the impacts of being able to harvest key species such as elephant or lion and, and local, national or international, more importantly international restrictions around those animals such as here for example, let's just take lion for instance. They have the six-year rule. A lion can't be shot under six years of age. Where, where does that rule come from? It was initiated by a wildlife biologist, uh, an American working here in Tanzania, and somehow the world seems to have accepted it. I think this is a whole new subject, and I don't really think this is the occasion to get into it, but I personally feel that that rule has had a direct impact on the populations of lions to a negative effect. I'm not going to divulge into it because this is something that we could spend two weeks discussing. <laughs> but taking lion pretty much out of the equation, there are very few lion hunters coming here now compared to what we used to have. Taking them out of the equation has led to many areas pretty much becoming obsolete because there were some areas that were really good for lion, but also had eland and buffalo and kudu and zebra and other animals that people would hunt. But because we weren't able to then harvest as many lion because less people are coming for lion, as a result of this is that some of those areas were returned back to the government and became vacant areas. And the direct, so not operated for anything. Not operated for anything. And of course the government doesn't have the revenue to look after those areas either. So what you've seen in some of these places is a total habitat destruction, loss of invasion with the cattle like people. Like what I've seen. The slash and burn agriculture. And so now nothing exists there. So you, you're saying, because I, I think that for, for many people the concept of killing a lion will be a difficult thing to think about. But what you're just saying to me is that that the fact that people are, and it's a rel relatively small number of people, yeah. but are, are, and a relatively small number of lions by comparison. And I wish I, I did a, people should go back and listen to the conversation I did with Dr. Amy Dickman. I can't remember what number it was because we, she was a, or is a lion researcher for Oxford University. Yeah. And we talked about the difference between uh, the numbers shot legally under a permit system and then those numbers that are poisoned and killed illegally and it's a st it's a staggering number by comparison yeah. but what you're saying to me is that this restriction and yes these known this known quantity of lions are no longer being killed by visiting hunters has been net negative not just for lions but for other species as well yeah. I, I, the word killed is not necessarily a word i prefer, like to use in in our business mm -hmm. although that's what we essentially do but we like I prefer to use the word harvest mm -hmm. or because it's sustainable and so what we're taking what we're taking off with any species is a very very small percentage I, and as and as magnificent as a lion is many many people would not accept the concept of a lion being harvested and fair enough I totally appreciate that but I'm talking about it as a key species here in a case where the lack of it has had such negative impact that not only, I, maybe I'm starting to divulge into this a little bit, but in a nutshell, would you prefer that I went out there in an area that's this size of one and a half million acres and choose one or two selected old male lions to be harvested, which would in turn generate a lot of revenue for the government, for us to operate this area and keep it going as a business, and also for communities to also become beneficiaries because there's tourism going on here and work and so on. So all the spin-off benefits that take place. Would it not be better that I chose two animals to harvest then see a bunch of cattle walk in, poison carcasses, an entire prize of lion be lost, such as 
females, cubs, young breeding males, etc. I'm talking about a whole lot just going overnight. So, so maybe we might harvest one or two a year or one or two every other year. It doesn't matter. The takeoff is really minimal. What's being killed out here? Dozens. I saw here a year ago a pride of 15 lion, two young males, four or five good mature females, a bunch of cubs of different ages, you know, relatively big cubs, the youngest being about four or five months old. It was such a wonderful sign. And they were so chilled out, you know. We stopped, we took photographs of them, we, we just remarked on how well they blended into the bush with this, these small palm trees and yellow grass around us. It, it, it was such. A, I, I think we gave up any idea of going looking for Sudatunga or bushbuck <laughs> or whatever it was on that particular morning. We sat there for about an hour just watching these things. It was wonderful. It really was. And the person with me enjoyed it as much as I did. You know, even though you paid a lot of money to come here for a hunt, we gave up going to look for that buffalo. It was just so nice to see this. So. Yeah, so getting back to the impacts that have happened as an international result over the years, there have been several. There are various waves, economic waves, regulations, countries having import restrictions one way or another, making it harder for hunters to actually take their, their trophies back home with them. And now particularly as we see it in the UK, I'm really, 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 really worried about this. It's just happened. I don't know what the long-term impact of this is going to be for all of us. As a hunting community, no matter what we say, the world won't listen to us. The people that come up with these great ideas don't seem to care that we lose what's out here. And it boils down to, really, we're going to lose another 20% here. And, you know, right now, we're running two camps. Fifteen years ago, we were running seven camps. So, I can't tell you how many text messages and WhatsApp messages I get from previous workers of ours asking if I've got any work for them. And it's really tough to say, I'm hoping things will get better soon, and I'm hoping that I can give you your position back. Wow, that must be hard. Yeah, on a really, when back in the day, we probably, in the busy time of the season, we probably had about 150 people working for us. Right now, a busy time of the season, absolutely maxed out if we had a really good run, uh, doing a lot of extra anti-poaching work and things like that, I'd say we're probably capping in around about 80 at the moment. And... I'm trying to give as many people work as possible. But the more of these pressures that come our way, it's going to be saying more, I'm sorry, fella, there's not going to be anything next year. And we can't have that. And these are the same people that, have, like myself, have spent their lives in these wilderness areas with us from year, year after year after year. So, UK... I think you've really messed up. I think you've made the wrong decision. Um, I think it's just been done on a whim. It's been done through sentiment. It hasn't been done through any practical reasoning. Um, I'd, I would invite any of those people to come and spend two weeks with me here in this area who make those decisions. And I'd like to say, let's just leave all our trucks behind and let's go for a walk. And let's hope that we bump into some lion, and let's hope we bump into some elephant. But the way things are going, less and less so is that going to be the case. And what those countries should actually be doing is trying to find ways to help support us out here and help keep these areas going. Because if we don't get that support, it'll all be gone. And currently we're only getting the support from people who actually appreciate what we're doing. It's done by private people and private associations. Hmm. What are your hopes for the future? If you could paint a picture of the future ahead of you, 
uh, given all the challenges that you face and the wildlife faces and the ecosystems that they exist in faces. And you could throw this out into the atmosphere, into the world. What are your hopes for the future? Happy trees, happy grasslands, happy animals, happy people. All of it living in harmony one way or another in their own little place. As in, I would love to be able to drive along where I've driven with you this morning and see, like I have done in this very patch of ground, herds of buffalo, herds of roan antelope, herds of sable antelope, reedbuck running around, impala running around, African hunting dogs or wild dogs up and down this floodplain, birds, vultures, I would love to just see lion, leopard tracks, leopard even. We're sitting under a tree right now. It's happened to several of us where we pulled out our picnic and sat under a tree and looked <laughs> up and there's a leopard who's been hiding up above <laughs> us and just immediately as eye contact has been made that they've dropped out the tree and disappeared. Uh, it's, it always gets everybody's attention. <laughs> but... Um, I would just love to see more and more and more of that. Although, actually, come back to leopard. That's an incredibly versatile animal. They learn to live in and around and amongst people really, really well. They do. Yeah. So, you know, so they're, they're quite adaptable compared to other species. But I really like to refer to lion as a barometer of a healthy wilderness. If you have a good lion population, you've got a really healthy wilderness. Because they, they, they need to consume the other wild animals it, in it. It's such a key species. It's, mm. it's such a barometer. It's such an important animal here. It, it, yeah. And we, we do, and we, we don't have as many lion as we've had in the past because we got the pressures from livestock on the, on the surrounding parts of this area. And the poisoning has definitely had, in, had an impact. Uh, the Lumbe Plains that we were on yesterday morning when we went to uh, go and see if we could get some people off of go and check on some fishermen on the floating island with our amphibious vehicle, which, by the way, is um, the most magnificent thing but a pain in the neck to operate. Uh, so in our particular instance yesterday, we had to abandon because the machine was causing us mechanical issues, sadly. Anyway, back to terra firma, and we'll find a way of finding those people on that island another, by some other means another day. But uh, yeah, the, my real dream is just to see a real flourishing wilderness and a happy balance where people can live on the perimeter, but well-educated people who understand and are trained and guided by people who can come in and help educate them and show them ways of improving their lives and having less of an impact on the wilderness self, wilderness itself, where the wildlife itself is really flourishing in large, healthy numbers. Just so that we can just, if anything, just to see it. Mm. Well, Derek, thank you so much for having me this last week and for taking the time to sit down with me today as uh, as we're about to depart. I think we're probably about an hour away from the plane arriving, actually bringing in uh, your next safari guests. That's that right. Your brother is guiding. Yeah. We're, we're leaving, unfortunately. I would like to stay. We're leaving, but your brother's coming in with guests to enjoy a safari and all of this wildness and wonders that's ahead of them. Yeah, yeah, they'll be in for a couple of weeks and I'm sure they're gonna have a wonderful time. I'm sure they are. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you as well, Baron. It's been really good having you.